a pleasure and a privilege to talk with Nile Rogers, legendary music composer and producer, and of course, founder member of the supergroup Chic, along with Bernard Edwards. Niall and Sheik were here in Marbella in 2012, and just over a year later, at the end of August 2013, they return. Hi, Niall. Hey, Martin, how are you? I guess a lot must have happened in the year since you were last in Marbella. Is there anything in particular that stands out? Oh, come on, that's so obvious. And get lucky having the biggest selling uh, <laughs> single in the world. I mean, that's um, pretty extraordinary, going number one in 97 countries. I mean... I didn't even know a record could do that. It's just truly amazing. And what's really even more incredible is the bravery of Daft Punk to do a record, to do a song like that, to do an album like that. We did it with no record company. We did it all on our own. We did it more than a year ago. As a matter of fact, when I was in Marbella last time, the record was already finished. And I just couldn't talk about it. That must have been difficult if you knew how good a record it was. Well, I knew it was good, but you don't you don't know if it's going to find an audience. I mean, that that's the thing is that good work doesn't guarantee an audience. I mean, because one, the, there are so many variables that go into getting a hit record. And also, you know, most records don't recoup, let alone go number one, let alone go number one in half the countries on Earth. Have you performed Get Lucky Live yet? We inadvertently did it uh, last week. We were on a television show. So the guy just asked me to play it. And so the girls and I were on the show. So right. once I started playing it, they felt silly just standing there. So they just started singing it. Now, we, we weren't planning on singing it. I just was playing it to show them how the part went. But we're standing there on camera. And, you know, we're on television. So it looks a little silly. So they just instinctively started singing it. And thank God they went to commercial rather quickly. This is a really unusual circumstance, having a, such a huge hit record, and yet it's never been performed live anywhere. R right, because, I mean, you know, if you just go back in history, I've done this many, 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 many times before. And when I wrote I'm Coming Out, I didn't play that until, you know, Diana Ross had gone out and played it a few times. When I wrote We Are Family... I didn't go out and play that until Sister Sledge and He's the Greatest Dancer and all those great songs. I actually just started playing Let's Dance by Bowie recently because we had been doing chic songs and, and Like a Virgin. We, we didn't play Like a Virgin until a couple of years ago. And we did it one night as a joke and people loved it. And we just said, OK, well, let's keep it in. I think I want uh, and this is something that I've always artistically felt is the right thing to do. Uh, when I write songs for other artists, I want them to establish it as their song before I go off and play it. Imagine what it would be would have done to our show if, you know, after playing Good Times, we come back and as an encore, we play Get Lucky. It would be unbelievable. <laughs> but, you know, it's like that just, you know, honestly, for me as a writer, as a producer, as a person who's loyal to their artist, I mean, it's it's Daft Punk's record. Yeah, sure. I co-wrote it, but I co-wrote a lot of stuff. Look at, you know, like, look, look at I'm coming out when when Diana Ross, when that hit, we were still on tour with Chic. Yeah, sure. We had a lot of big records that we could play. Man, imagine how amazing. I mean, will you hear it now? You hear how great I'm coming out and all that stuff sounds now, you know, but so I just divorce it from my mind. I don't think about it. Um, and, and And, you know, just like I don't think about this. So what we do is we play the song at the end of the night to clear the stage, but we just play the recording like, you know, DJs or something. And it's great. It's really great. It adds a lot of fun, a lot of spirit, keeps the song alive. I get to pay tribute to, you know, Daft Punk and Pharrell and everybody, and it's nice. And it was great. I don't know if you saw the, the MTV Awards the other day. That was the first time the four of us were in a room together since we did the music video. The Glastonbury gig and the single with Daft Punk must have introduced you to a younger audience. Do you think that will create a bigger interest in 70s, 80s music again? I don't predict anything like that because I, I, I have no idea why people respond to stuff they respond to, uh, especially en masse. You know, they, you know I, I don't know that stuff. And if anybody knew it, they'd be the richest, most successful person in the world. None of us know this stuff. And, you know, it's nice to talk about it and blah, blah, blah. And I know that if I said it now, it wouldn't mean anything you know, it just good, it'd be good to read about. But 
you know, I, I don't like to, to do that because I know that I don't know. I, I'm very clear that I don't know. I, I do music from my heart. I do music that makes me feel good. You know, when you think about Get Lucky, it's good that we can talk about something that's current. This is a song that I wrote and recorded more than a year. I mean, it's like, you know, 15, 16 months ago, if not more. So this is a, already a year and a half old as far as the composition is concerned. The fact that it's in the atmosphere now shows that what I've always done and always believed in my whole life is the right thing. You write music for the future, even though you're doing it right now. Because you don't know what trends are going to happen. And when you think about it, Get Lucky, I don't believe it's part of a trend. I think it's just so big that it just stands out and you can sort of make some kind of argument that maybe it is because of Bruno Mars record and, you know, and a couple of other records that are, you know, that are retro sounding. But, you know, Jamiroquai has always been sort of like that. And, you know, another artist. So, yeah, I don't really know. I think it sounds so good and so natural that maybe that's why it was such a big seller so quickly. I'll take that. <laughs> okay. Right, let's go back a few years. You were a regular at Studio 54. How easy was it to get in? Well, once I got in, I, it was really easy because my record, in a strange way, defined Studio 54. In my song, The Freak, it even says, Just come on down to 54, find your spot out on the floor. Aw, oh, freak out. You know, but... Prior to that, I could only get in with my girlfriend, who was sort of in the scene uh, at the time. And then the one time I tried to get in without her uh, resulted in me writing, you know, our freak out because they didn't let us in. As a matter of fact, they slammed the door in our faces and told us to fuck off, <laughs> even though we had been invited by Grace Jones. Wow. In truth, that actually only happened one time because after that, it... Um, you know, we didn't really release Le Freak right away, but Dance, Dance, Dance and Everybody Dance started to become very popular very quickly. By the time we had written Le Freak, oh, I was a regular at Studio 54. I certainly didn't need that as the calling card. I just think it's funny you were refused admission at the door, yet the DJ was spinning all your tracks. That's sort of what's ironic about, you know, that institution. But thank God it happened. Had that not have happened, there was no way that we would have written Le Freak because Le Freak was a direct reaction to that. I didn't have that riff in my head. I didn't have down, down, dinner, dinner, down, 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 down. I didn't have that in my head. I just came up with that that night. That is a cool story. Back in the day at Studio 54, what were your favorite dance tracks? Oh, I mean, those were the days of unbelievable dance music to me um first village people album donna summer like crazy i mean anything by donna summer that that time she had already passed uh, you know uh the i love to love you baby and all that stuff so she was already doing um i think it was called the four seasons of love spring affair autumn changes i mean those records were incredible Sarone, super nature oh my god eddie kendrick's girl you need a change of mind there were so many big, 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 great dance records going down to Love Town, the Joneses, Sugar Pie Guy, I mean, just tons of records. Yeah, I still love the classics from those days as well. But let's get a little bit more up to date. What are your favorite songs at the moment? Um, well, th that's always a problem because my favorite songs are usually songs that I just happen to be listening to that day or that week and stuff like that. So to use words like favorite makes it like superlative. And that's just not true. It's just my favorite at the moment. Um, and it means it's because I'm listening to it at the moment. So in the last few days, what have I been listening to? Obviously the new Daft Punk single, um, Lose Yourself to Dance, which I've always loved right from the beginning. I listened to that like almost 10 times a day since the record came out. Niall, you look so relaxed on stage when performing. But there must have been some embarrassing moments. Any in particular come to mind? A few months ago, uh, or maybe even just a few weeks ago, uh, we were playing in Hyde Park with Lionel Richie and Jennifer Lopez. And in uh, the UK, they've been going through a really lengthy hot spell this summer. And it was so hot that the amplifiers for the sound system overheated right at the beginning of our Chic show. And it was incredible because we're on stage and the amplifiers that are running our gear 
is shaded and under, you know, it's on stage with us there. So we're hearing the monitors thinking everything sounds fine. And we're, one, we're looking at the people wondering why they're not dancing and having a great time because we're killing it. We sound great. Finally, the people started booing. And I was like, whoa, this, this has got to be some kind of conspiracy. We really, we really sounded great. How could like 65, th- this was a bigger crowd for us than Glastonbury. Glastonbury, I think we had 45,000 or 40,000, something like that. Here's 65,000 people booing us. And then we finally realized that the sound system isn't working. So I, I stopped the show and I thanked the people for booing us. I said, hey, you should be booing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I didn't know that the sound wasn't working yet. I actually meant this in a sincere way. I said, you know, our shows have been going so amazing. We're so accustomed to things being fantastic. Maybe we needed to be brought down a peg. And, and we're not egotistical, we're just confident. We love doing what we do. And then so the people were looking at me going, what are you talking about? Why are you apologizing? It's not your fault. And I'm like going, oh, the sound system doesn't work. (laughs) I'm thinking to me, we were playing amazing. It sounded so good. And they're booing and not dancing. I'm like, what the hell is going on? So that was interesting because the, the promoters, and it's a big outfit, obviously, if it's Lionel Richie and Jennifer Lopez, are telling me to leave the stage. Because, you know, people were booing and they're thinking that I'm feeling bad. And I'm like going, no, no, no. If things stink, I'm going to stay right out here with the people and let them boo. And I'll do whatever I can. So I, I realized that they came over to me and they gave me one microphone that seemed to be working. So I started to talk to the people. And that's when I told them, you know, OK, I appreciate you booing me. It lets us know that something's wrong. So I knew that one microphone was working and I took that one microphone and had my road manager stick it in front of my amplifier. And I started playing, you know, probably something like I'm coming out so that the whole crowd could sing it with me. And it was amazing. (laughs) So I turned a horrifying moment into something really great. And then the crowd got into it with us. And then since my my uh, my technical people were pretty smart and they realized that if they rerouted the um the the monitor system out to the front of the house at least people could hear what we're hearing and that's exactly what they did and then we carried on and did a great show and it was awesome i'm glad i wasn't the sound engineer on that anyway 80s fashion has made a big comeback especially in europe uh what would you wear to a fancy dress retro party what would I wear? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, because I still have everything that I've ever owned during those days. So I have a whole closet full of stuff I could pick. I would probably choose like, you know, sort of super fly pimp kind of outfit. <laughs> I always think that stuff looks really, really funny and way over the top. And I like wearing big platform shoes. You know, I, that way I could, you know, sort of like court girls that are like, you know, you know six feet tall. Or <laughs> so what has been the worst comment someone has made about you? Oh, you look like an asshole with that 80s pimp outfit on or whatever. I, I, you know, I think if I could think of something, probably, and and this is a weird thing because it was the the entire staff of Atlantic Records telling me that the song The Freak was one of the worst things that they ever heard when we went to play it for them, telling them that this was going to be our new hit single. And when we went in there, it was a room full of A&R people and radio people and all that. I mean, the entire staff in the conference room. And by the time the song finished, you know, it's pretty long on, you know, on the album, I guess seven or eight minutes, something like that. By the time the song finished, the entire conference room had cleared, save for me, my partner, Bernard Edwards, and our attorney. And we were sitting in there in an empty conference room that had heretofore been packed. Then they came in, they designated one person to come in and tell us that the song sucked and what else did we have on the album? Well, actually he said, do we have anything better on the album? We have two songs, at least two, three songs that are better than that. And we played those songs for them. They said, well, yeah, let's release one of those. And we looked at them and said, are you nuts? None of those songs, yeah, they may be better compositionally, but none of them are as commercial as La Freak. Anyway, long story short, you know, Atlantic Records is a pretty big, prestigious label with, you know, everybody yeah. from... You know, the Rolling Stones, Aretha Franklin, the Led Zeppelin, the Crosby, Stills and Nash. Yes. Well, the biggest selling song in the history of that label is La Freak, the one that they walked out on and told us sucked. 
why it makes you wonder sometimes about who gets the jobs in these record companies. Anyway, what's the nicest thing someone has said about you? Well, probably a lot of nice things have been said to me, but I could just think of recent stuff, how people tell me how, you know, Get Lucky is like, you know, the, the best song that they've heard, you know, in years. And some people think it's like the best song they've ever heard. Um, right. I, I, I find that very flattering because I don't know what makes something the best song other than the fact that you like it right now. Yeah. So a year from now, a person will say that to somebody else about another song. But lately, I've been hearing that over and over and over again. People telling me how much they're moved by the song Get Lucky. And, you know, I'll hear it every place I go and this and that. I'm so amazed. But, you know, look, I've heard that certainly about the song We Are Family. People's comments about We Are Family have brought me to tears at times. So, you know, I know that this is somewhat fleeting. I grew up going to science school and music school and, and, you know, and my professors would always tell me that the scientific brain and the composer's brain uh, basically are exactly the same and that, uh, you know, your most productive period is in your in your 20s. You know, they say, you know, Albert Einstein, um, his theory of relativity, he came up with that, you know, in his 20s. He said he just spent the rest of his life talking about it. And I know that that's somewhat true. But I feel very fortunate in that I've been able to write hit records and pop records ever since I've started doing it. And what's really odd is that I had a huge disdain for pop music when I first started out. I used to look down upon it and think that because I was a jazz musician or a classical musician that this type of music was below me or beneath me. And uh, one of my esteemed learned teachers pulled me aside one day and berated me and said to me, you know, what? who the hell am I to think that I'm the ultimate consumer? What makes me think I'm the ultimate consumer? And he told me that any record that sells a million copies is great. And this is coming from a guy who, who chose jazz as his main form of expression. Yeah. Not many million selling jazz singles. And his concept uh, was that any time a song sells a million it's great and i said well why would you say that he says it's great because it touches the hearts minds and souls of a million strangers and i thought to myself oh my god that's amazing well about three months after that i wrote my first hit single that sold a million copies and touched the hearts minds and souls of a million strangers because i was completely unknown well i have to say after your concert last year so many people came up to me to say how touched they were that after such a long set on stage in the heat of the Marbella night, you still had time to spend with them, chat to them, have your picture taken with them, generally just pass time with your with your fans. Oh, I'm I'm thrilled that people wanted and, and support us. I mean, you know, I know the promoter was taking a big chance bringing us there, and you know, I feel like no one knows who we are. I'm a relatively faceless guy. Um, the thing that sort of made me a little bit more known is because of the Daft Punk clip. You don't see their faces, but you see Pharrell and me. So, you know, maybe now people say, oh, hey, that's like, a, you know, it's funny. Someone sent me a tweet the other day and said, a lot of people who are like 12 years old or 15 years old who don't even know Daft Punk until now thinks that Pharrell and I are Daft Punk and the two guys in the robots are part of the sort of gimmick of the promotion. Dance, 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 yowza, yowza, yowza. Uh, what does yowza mean? It, it probably started out as yes, sir, which is why um, when we first came out with the record, people were um, a little bit upset with us, especially black people. And it's funny, too, because I started my career as in a very, very political organization, the Black Panther Party. So I kept thinking to myself, when people would criticize me for writing yowza, 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 because I actually wrote that lyric, I said, you know, it's funny that you guys would have the nerve to say that to me, because basically it was a slave phrase that meant yowza, boss, yes, a boss, you know, like you, you would say to the slave master. What happened is that in the 20s, it became a slang as a lot of black vernacular becomes um, usurped by the sort of white masses and becomes cool because they hear it so much and they incorporate it into their language. So yowza, instead of it being yowza balls, yes, sir, ma'am, I understand, wound up becoming, becoming yowza, yowza, yowza. And it was to get people's attention. 
So was I going, yes, sir, yes, sir, or yes, sir, or, you know, that kind of thing. And Barkers used to use this at dance marathons. Um, during the Great Depression, they would do all of these gimmicky things for people to make a little money. And the last couple standing would win, you know, 500 or a thousand, whatever, something yeah. that was just life altering in those days of having no money. But they were basically like Roman spectacles. It was, you know, what sometimes people would die at these things. You'd die of dehydration and all sorts of stuff. And when uh, the, the disco era rolled around the mid 70s, I noticed that records were getting longer, especially with the 12 inch. And when I heard I love to love you, baby, over and over and over again, and the DJ could go from one term, turntable to the next, I was like, wow, this is like the dance marathons of the 20s. So that's why we stuck it in our very first big record. If you could put together a band of past and present musicians, who would they be? Who would you choose? Well, that would be interesting because if it was a band to make money and go out and play my kind of commercial music, that would be a different band. If it were a band to play jazz music, that would be a different band. But no matter what configuration or what people I would have on, say, the drums or the piano uh, or you know saxophone or trumpet or string section, the bass player would absolutely be Bernard Edwards, regardless of the style of music. Yeah, my old partner, Bernard Edwards, yeah, was yeah. the greatest musicians I've ever met and versatile and could make anything sound great. Niall, what's your most valuable possession? I would say my guitar, my Fender, my hit maker, as we call it. And the reason why I say that is that it's generated more money than anything that I've ever owned. Years ago, uh, the Harry Fox agency said that it had played on more than $2 billion worth of music, but that was years ago, way before Get Lucky and, you know, and the new Avicii record that I got out now, which looks like it's going to be a big smash. But then when it comes to things that I own, if it wasn't my guitar or instruments, uh, you know, collectible things or art or cars or boats or anything like that, I would have to say my New York City apartment. Um, because it's that amazing and that special. I consider it a sort of place where my, I watched my life transform. I went from a crazy 80s nutty party guy who did still make a lot of hit records um, to, um, you know, so went from this party palace to a peaceful, arty <laughs> retreat. And it's the same apartment. I never changed the decor. It was... So it's just the way that you look at life. You know, when people would walk into my apartment, they would go, oh, my God, this is magnificent. Unbelievable. A bachelor lives in a place like this. Now you walk in and people go, oh, my God, this is incredible. It's beautiful. You have such great taste. So you've got your New York pad, but home for you is Connecticut. And in your home, you have a built in studio. So what do you do to relax after gigging? Yeah, I don't think I relax in the traditional sense of relaxation. To me, relaxing is getting a chance to work. <laughs> and, and the work that I call relaxing is always the work that I'm not doing. So since I've been home writing songs with, with Avicii and Adam Lambert and other people, yeah, it's true, I just played a concert last week. Yes, it's true, before I played that concert last week, I played a concert the week before with Paul McCartney. But it's not like being on tour where we're playing show after show after show. I sort of missed that, even though when we were doing it a few weeks ago, I was like, going, okay, I've had enough. I can't wait to get home and write. If you could do something again, what would that be? I don't think that I would want to change anything because even all the bad stuff that's happened to me, those things have been the greatest teachers. You know, I would obviously not want to do whatever it was that allowed me to <laughs> get aggressive cancer, but I don't even know what that was. And my heart has stopped eight times because of doing coke and all that stuff. But had that not happened, maybe I wouldn't have woken up and I could have died ages ago. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think I needed to die eight times to say, OK, I don't want it to be nine or that the ninth time will be the final time. I don't, I don't know. I'm thankful that I died but didn't stay dead, um, e even though that's not what made me stop. What made me stop drugging? is embarrassment at Madonna's 38th birthday party. And it's funny, too, because her, her birthday is on August 16th, 
And it was August 15th that she had this party. And that was 19 years ago. I haven't had a drink or drug in 19 years. Hey, good for you, man. <laughs> I can't believe it. It's like me not drinking and drugging. How could that possibly be? <laughs> I was a glue sniffer at 11 years old. I was like. You recently posted that you are cancer free. That must have been a, a great relief to you. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's funny that I, uh, I mean, I appreciate people saying that they beat it. And in my mind, I would like to think that. But I just use the word cancer free because that's the word the doctor uses. But I always remind them that the day before they gave me my diagnosis, I was cancer free then too. I said, that's a term, <laughs> which frankly means in my case, that meant that they just hadn't found it yet, that it was there, but they didn't know it was there. So in America, which is a litigious society, I, they think they use that term to protect the doctors. You know, it's like, oh, we, they, we can't find the cancer, so you're cancer free. I am now smart enough to know that that just means that they gave me a test and they didn't find any cancer. Whoopee. Then let's hope that that's absolutely real and that it's great. And believe me, I'm thankful and appreciative. I'm still here because I know that when they found the cancer, it was very aggressive and they were very alarmed and they did not think I could, that I'd be, be here. And this is now two and a half years later. Well, that is good news. And I'm sure all your fans will hope that you stay cancer free for the rest of your life. Niall, what's your favorite meal and what's your favorite drink? I would have to say probably the thing that I eat the most and the thing that I eat the most is a vegetable lasagna made by my housekeeper. That's just to die for. She's Hungarian and man, she knows how to cook. Um, believe it or not, I drink um, these uh, aromatic club sodas, seltzer. They're not sweetened or anything like that. They just have the scent of grapefruit and raspberries and things like that because I need to have something bubbly and strong. We have a, a chain of stores here called Trader Joe's and they happen to see, they seem to have more CO2 in them than the other seltzers. So that's what I like. Artists who say a few words in Spanish when they're on the Spanish tour always get a great response from the nationals. Can you speak any Spanish? Mm, well, a lot of people in my family are Spanish and I always think my accent is terrible. And also S Spain, it's different than my Spanish. Spanish relatives who are from Puerto Rico. And they're, they're, you know, so yeah, I can speak a little Spanish. Finally, Niall, you have a huge repertoire of songs, not just with Chic, but with other artists. Do you plan your concert or do you leave some of it open to interpretation from the audience reaction? Um, we just have a good time. I think that um, the set list, you know, there are a lot of, we, we like to have something for everybody. So, you know, at the end of the night, people say, oh, I like this song the best. Or people say, oh, my God, I had no idea you played that song. Because we don't know what we're going to play. I, I know how the beginning is going to start. And I know how the end is going to, the, how the show is going to end. We start the show with a, a symbolic moment. Uh, I don't tell many people about this, but for my partner, Bernard Edwards, we usually wear white because when, uh, when he died in Japan and when I went to... Uh, the police station, they had his body wrapped in a white kimono. And so we usually wear white to symbolize that moment. And we start the show with the very first song I ever wrote for Chic, which is called Everybody Dance. So we know we start with that and we end with the last hit Chic ever had, which was Good Times. Um, and then the show is sort of basically the arc of Nile Rogers' life. It shows the first Chic hits, then it shows when we veered off and made hit records for other people as Chic. And then, then it shows my life when I went as a solo producer. Um, and then we come back to Chic. Excellent. So, but there's also other stuff in the middle that I can call out any night based on the audience. So you never know. Niall, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm looking forward to the concert and I hope we get a chance to have a chat after you've been on stage. I'm sure, Martin. Thanks so much, man. <laughs>